if if anyone has any questions left over about projectiles, now is the time. Does anyone have any, now that you've had a chance to do homework, um, see what you're having trouble with? Does anyone have um, any particular, you know, problems? Haley? So I had a couple that I wrote down. Sometimes when I was getting to the very end and I would have to put stuff under the square root um, and there would be like a negative sign under there. Can we just like ignore that? Because I know we can't take a negative of the square root. No. Uh, if you're getting a negative inside of the square root, it means one of two things. Um, the first thing, which it probably means, is you made a mistake somewhere in your signs. So um, it could be that the displacement was a negative number. Something fell 20 meters from the top of a building and you didn't put in negative 20 for displacement. Or it could be the initial velocity. Well, the initial velocity won't cause that error. Maybe you didn't put in negative 9.8 for the acceleration. You only put in 9.8. So typically, that's most likely it. I would look for sign errors. Okay. okay. Um, but the second thing is if you're trying to answer a question that doesn't have an answer. So, for example, you kick the ball at a certain speed and you're asking, you know, how long does it take to get on top of this building? But you didn't kick it fast enough to get on top of the building. Okay. No. So then when you're solving for the time, you're going to get an imaginary number, which tells you that the thing that you are solving for never happens. Okay. But that's unlikely. That probably only happens if I make a mistake when I write the problem and pick numbers that don't work out. When you're solving homework problems, you should probably get a number, a real number, and um, it's probably a minus sign error. Okay. And then I had a second question, too. It was about, because you just said, like, anytime something's falling down or whatever, we use that as like a negative number. But on question 5.7, it says, like, a body is projected downward at an angle of 30 degrees. Uh -huh. So I did it all and got the wrong answer. And then I was like, I don't know why I got this wrong. And I went back, and it says that, in like, for the answer solution they have, choose downward as a positive. Yeah, so the books sometimes do that. That's kind of a physicist trick that I would not recommend because I think it's going to confuse you. So instead, let me uh, put the whiteboard up. Um, you know, how do you handle that? So, so the, the idea is, if everything in your problem is downward, so everything's going to be negative, you could just call downward positive, so everything would be positive. So, like, if your um, equation is like minus, well, why do I have green? Um, So if you had like minus 20 meters equals minus, you know, 10 times the sine of theta times t minus one half times 9.8 times t squared. This would be kind of a quadratic equation you might get if the displacement is negative and the initial velocity is negative and the acceleration is negative. And from a math standpoint, you can just multiply this whole equation by minus one you know, on both sides. And basically what happens is all of these minus signs cancel. So sometimes physicists do this trick. They say, oh, well, let's just call down positive. And that's kind of like multiplying the whole equation with one. But I don't think that's very beneficial, honestly. I don't think it saves you very much. And I think it confuses you. So in that particular problem that you're talking about, um, you have this, you know, something of, is projected downward, okay? So the picture looks something like this. Um, so that angle is negative 30 degrees. So when you're finding VIY, I don't remember the number, maybe it's like 20 or something, you would do 20 times the sine of negative 30, and you're going to get negative 10. 
Okay, so that's that's what, what's really happening in that problem you're talking about is the and I don't know if it's negative ten or what because I don't have the problem in front of me, but um, the v i y should be a negative number. And if you put that in as positive because you just say, oh, it's a thirty degree angle, I'm going to do sine of thirty, then you wind up getting positive ten. And if you have a positive 10 for VI, but a negative 9.8 for the acceleration, then your signs are not consistent. Okay? But I would, I know some of the problems say call down positive. And hopefully, you, like you did, you only see that after you tried the problem and then you're looking at the solution and you have an error. I think the solution to the error is not call down positive, it's figure out why you didn't have, and I'd be willing to bet that the problem was your V initial, you didn't have a negative number. Um, so like once you realize that's the problem, then your intuition increases. And if you see that kind of situation again, you'll know what to do. Okay, um, any, uh, any other questions about that or uh, Elise? So in this example that you're showing, should mm -hmm. this 9.8 be negative? Yeah, so in the real problem, if I'm doing that, um, you know, that there's going to be kind of minus 9.8 there. I like to just put the minus into the equation instead. So normally when I do it, I wind up just saying this whole thing is minus 4.9. So the, the one half times the minus 9.8, I usually just give that a minus 4.9. Is that kind of what you're, you're meaning? Yeah, that answered it. Yeah, okay, so um, good. Other questions? Christian. Uh, for 5.13 uh, on the homework last night, when it showed how it solved for delta y, it used 72.8 mm meters per second when the initial velocity was 9, uh, 95 meters per second and I, I just didn't see how they got that number and I was just kind of curious as to that. Um, I don't have that problem in front of me. Unfortunately, I didn't, I don't know why I don't have the problems here, but it sounds like that you need to use only the y component of the initial velocity. So in the equation, you're going to have diy equals i times sine of theta. So you don't just use the number they told you for initial velocity, but you have to, to get the component because that thing is, you know, it's going to be pointing at an angle. And whatever that angle is, if this is VI, you only want the opposite side, which is VIY. So you're going to get that by taking the hypotenuse. And since it's the opposite side, you use the sine of theta. Do you think that could be the problem? Uh, yeah, that looks like it. Okay. Yeah, that's what I would. That's what I was thinking. Great. Um, so normally I don't. Uh, I don't like to go over homework problems in class because some people who are tuning in may not try that problem. Um, so with problems that are questions about particular problems, just stick around after class or set up a different collaborate meeting and I'm happy to go over like in full gory detail problems that you've been working on and having trouble with but if I do them and people who didn't try them yet watch me solve it then it kind of it, it takes the fun away I, I mean I'm saying that kind of tongue-in-cheek but it like the benefit of the problems is not seeing the answer or the solution it's it's trying to figure it out and just like Christian had um, having one little problem, like, okay, this, this isn't right. I don't know why. And once you kind of get a targeted answer to that question, you learn a lot. But if you just see how to do the problem, it doesn't stick. So, um, how, uh, so does anyone have other kind of not maybe more general questions um, just about projectiles in general that, that you – would like to know or, or types of examples you would like to see?
No? Okay, if you, if you have specific questions specific to your work, just stick around after class and um, we'll, we'll go over them. Or if, that, if you can't stick around after class, just set up a time with me in Calabria. I already have a, a couple of people set up for later today, so, um, but there's a lot of time to sort of slide, slide in your questions. So um, let me talk a little bit about what's going to happen after the contest. Okay, so of course we have a contest tomorrow, and I know you know 90 something percent of your energy is going to be focused on preparing. If you've done all the homework already, and you just have these certain questions, you're in great shape. You know, you're in great shape. So you can practice a little bit, pick some extra problems. Pick some of the supplementary problems that, that don't have solutions but have answers and try your hand. Um, if, you, if you do it, you don't get the right answer, send me your work in an email and I'll look it over and help you figure out you know, what's going wrong. Um, but this is perfect, the perfect situation if you're done already and now you can just do a little practice. Um, so after the contest on Friday, you uh, sometime Friday, hopefully I'll have it uh, posted by the time you're done, um, you'll see your next lab assignment, which is going to be due on Monday. And uh, you just need to do that sometime over the weekend. I mean, I assume Friday night, you know, you have to drink off the, the sorrows of the contest, but on Saturday or Sunday, hopefully, <laughs> you you can uh, find time to work on that lab and that lab will kind of help prepare you a little bit for what's going on on Monday. Um, so today, what are we doing? Um, today, I'm going to start introducing some background and uh, kind of beginning concepts for chapter four. Uh, chapters four and five are going to have their contest together as a unit. So it will be an 80 point test um, with 10 problems and eight, you know, you pick eight of them to solve and have graded. And uh, it's probably the, the most time consuming section of this course. I, I really like to start it slowly and build the intuition because I think if you get a good intuition at the beginning, um, you'll have a much easier time of it. It really is essential that you are confident with your vectors by the time we get to chapter four. So in chapter three, you have to be able to find components, V, I, X, and the Y. There's a little bit of vectors going on, but in chapter four, it's sort of like full on vectors. So, um, you know, as you're practicing for chapter three, really, really make sure you're feeling 100% confident about how to find components of vectors, how to add them, how to find the direction of a vector once, like a resultant vector once you get it, those types of things, because we need to, we need to master that. And we need to kind of conceptually understand it too and, and be able to visualize it. So what's, what are chapter four and five about? Basically, the idea here is we've, we've learned these awesome master quiz for motion, and they are pretty awesome. I mean, they, they explain a lot of things um, that we observe, but there's kind of this one limiting factor, which is we we don't usually know the acceleration except for free fall. And that's why we have a whole chapter, chapter three, that's just free fall problems, because that's one of the few examples of motion where we are guaranteed already to know what the acceleration is without any work or thought on our part. We just know that A, X is zero and A, Y is minus 9.8. It's always that way. So we never in chapter three worry about it. But what happens if it's not free fall? So for example, on the projectile motion, once we add in air resistance, then the acceleration vector is no longer vertical. It's no longer just 9.8 meters per second squared, and then it's not the case that Vx stays constant, and all these things change, okay? So the question is, what do we do in all of the other cases other than free fall? Whether it's just, you know, something, a projectile with air resistance, or a car on a, on a road with some friction, or, you know, whatever. It could be any everything else, but free fall, we don't know how to do it. So... Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of historical background 
that leads up to how we find the acceleration in the other sort of 99.9% .9 of the cases in the universe where the acceleration is not constant. How do we, or not, not G anyway, not negative G. So how do we find it? So first of all, the story um, for me begins with this guy um, named Tycho Brahe. Has anyone ever heard of him? Raise your hand if you ever heard of this guy. Yeah, almost no one's ever heard of him. He um, He's kind of an interesting character. He was a Danish nobleman. Actually, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his name. I did have a student from Denmark about two years ago, and I, I you know, when I brought this, he, like, he knows, of course he knows who this guy is because he's, he's famous in Denmark. And I said, oh, great, you know, how do you say his name? And he just said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, it's not actually like a, a normal Danish name. Nobody has a name like this anymore. So he, he thought of Tuco Bray, but he's not really sure. So I don't know. I don't know how to say this guy's name. But why, why are we talking about him? So he, uh, let me give you a little background on him. He was this Danish nobleman. He, um, he was born, his father was sort of like a second son. So he was like noble, but only the firstborn son inherited all like the land and property of his family. So he was like a poor nobleman. And his older brother, the one who inherited everything and was rich, um, didn't have any children. And so when he found out that Tycho's father and his wife were, were going to have a child, he said, you know, if your child is a, a boy, give him to me and I'll raise him and he can he can inherit our family, you know, land and money and stuff. And Tycho's father initially agreed to this, but when Tycho was born, he was mine. He didn't want to give up his son. So the rich brother abducted Tycho. He like snatched him up and stole him and raised him as his own child. So Tycho grew up thinking that his uncle was his father and his father was his uncle because they still lived in like the same city and I'm sure he saw his father, apparently Tycho's father once the abduction occurred, he didn't try to fight it too much because he maybe he didn't have any power. I don't know. Anyway, so Tycho grows up um, sort of under a false identity. And he um, he's given this really good education. He's very wealthy, probably too wealthy. He doesn't. He's a little bit kind of a rowdy youth. He gets in a lot of duels, and he uh, once famously loses a duel, and the victor cuts off his nose. So his the guy who won the duel sliced off his nose, and he wore this prosthetic. Actually, he had a bunch of different prosthetic noses. Some he had a nose and wooden noses that he wore the rest of his life. So, um, but that's not why we're talking about him in the physics class. He also had this really serious interest in astronomy. And um, he was so interested in astronomy that he bought his own island and he built an observatory there. And he spent decades on this island where, you know, I mean, we have light pollution now because of all the electric lights, but even then, he, it was a little bit darker and easier to see the stars if you were away from the, from the city. And so he's out on this island, and he invented his own device that would measure the locations of the planets more precisely than anyone had been able to do before. So the planets, you know, planet is a word that in Greek means wanderer, and at that time it was known, I mean, even in the time of the ancient Greeks, that there were these certain heavenly bodies that, that moved around. You know, the stars sort of form a fixed set, a fixed pattern. In fact, they thought the stars were just all on the inner side of some sphere that rotated around the Earth. It's called the sphere of the stars. And then these planets were thought to be other heavenly objects that lived on different spheres that rotated inside of the sphere of the stars in different patterns. And so uh, he measured, he, he made these devices that would measure their locations more precisely than anyone did uh, before. And what's really interesting is he was really um, kind of crap at math. So he, he had like these many, many notebooks full of numbers of the locations of the planets, but he did not know how to take those numbers and learn anything from them. 
and he didn't know how to analyze the data that he was collecting. So it's really remarkable that he spent decades collecting these data without really any firm idea what he was going to do with them. Um, but then he got a, an assistant, and the si assistant was named um, Johannes Kepler. Oops. Oh, I think maybe it's got two Ps. I don't. I don't know. No, that doesn't look right. Anyway, Johann Kepler, whoever watches this video later will no doubt look it up and let me know. Anyone ever heard of Kepler? Ziad has heard of him. A couple people. Um, Blair. So normally a few more people have heard of Kepler. So Kepler was, was very good at math. And he attached himself to Tycho Brahe. And he, you know, he basically was his assistant slash servant for a long period of time. And, um, you know, he wanted to get these data and analyze them. But Tycho was very uh, sort of jealous and guarded with the data. So he would not let these notebooks sort of out of his possession long enough for someone to analyze the data. And um, so Kepler worked with him for, for a very long time. And then Tycho Brahe kind of died mysteriously. He, uh, the story of his death comes from Kepler, who was there. Um, apparently, this story, I mean, take, take what you will out of the story. It can't really be true. But um, at any rate, the story is that Kepler reported that they were both together at a, like a dinner party, uh, hosted by an even bigger, fancier, richer noble. And that, that higher ranked noble was talking and sort of expostulating on some topic and going on and on and on. And Tycho had to go to the bathroom and he had to go really badly. Okay. But he couldn't get up while this guy was talking because it would be very rude. So he just held it for so long that his bladder burst. And he, like maybe a couple days later, he died this very miserable, terrible, painful death. So this death was considered kind of mysterious even at the time because um, it was well known that mercury poisoning would lead to this exact outcome, to this burst bladder and this, this death. And so there were whispers that maybe somebody poisoned Tycho Brahe with mercury. Um, we don't know if, if anyone poisoned him with mercury, but we do know that Kepler, as soon as Tycho died, he went back and he stole all of the notebooks. He took all these notebooks and he absconded with them. Um, Tycho's family was very angry about this and tried to get them back, but uh, Kepler didn't give them back, uh, or maybe he did after he analyzed them. That, that I don't know. But he analyzed all these data and he made some really... Um, remarkable discoveries, which is why some people have heard of Kepler and nobody's heard of Tycho Brahe. So, um, and, and by the way, uh, Danish scientists, I think maybe like in the late 90s or early 2000s, actually exhumed Tycho's corpse and tested it and found, tested his hair and found that he did have high levels of mercury and, and likely was poor in mercury, but it's unknown whether he just poison himself because a lot of people at that time were using mercury to try to turn lead into gold and um, you know he might have been doing something like that and just poison himself or I like to kind of imagine that Kepler took him out to, to get the data at any rate what did Kepler learn so he basically learned three facts um, by analyzing these data it was only possible because the data were so precise and so took place over such a long stretch of time. But, and it's, it's really amazing to me that he was able to do this without a computer or calculator or anything, just paper and pencil. But he saw that the planet, so let me draw a picture of, you know, the sun. And, um, my, I should have a toolbar here that I don't. So he saw that the planets move around the sun in an elliptical orbit. So this was remarkable for two reasons. First of all, the conventional wisdom before Kepler was that the planets are actually moving around the Earth. 
So Kepler was able to analyze these data and see that the planets move in orbit not around the Earth but around the Sun. So some, the ancient Greeks, some of them had thought had the same point of view, but then this had been later, for theological reasons, considered heretical and uh, was not allowed to put forth this theory. But Kepler, with these data, were able to show, to demonstrate, that the orbits were around the sun and not around the Earth. And secondarily, that they were not circles, they were ellipses. So that second part was huge because... You know, the idea, the conventional wisdom, even the Greeks, nobody had questioned the idea that the orbits of planets were perfect circles. They were thought to sort of occupy a sphere which would rotate around the Earth. Um, and if it's rotating around the sun, fine, but it should be a perfect circle. And the reason is these are heavenly bodies. They are sort of the, represent the perfection of the heavens. And if they're not a perfect circle, then all of a sudden one wonders, well, why why are they elliptical and why is this ellipse a little more stretched and another one is a little more like circle and you know there are all these why questions that occur which no one asks when it's the perfection of the heavens that there's just sort of this inherent logic behind you know the gods or god created the universe and made it perfect and there are these perfectly circular orbits of these heavenly bodies. And once we discover that they're not perfect circles, then one has to ask why. So that's his first sort of discovery. The second one is that the period of the orbit. So we use the letter T for period. And by the way, this is all historical background. So you don't need to know any of this at this time. But we will have a chapter on gravity later on where I will reintroduce all of this stuff and, and make it more technical, okay? So this is just for background. But the T stands for time period. That would be for the Earth, it's 365 and a quarter days. It's how long it takes for the planet to make a complete circuit around the sun. So that time period squared is proportional to, so this symbol is, stands for proportional to the radius cubed where since it's not a perfect circle, the radius is sort of defined as the average radius. Um, so this is a mathematical law, and that's very interesting because mathematical laws then sort of invite us to try to use formulas to figure out why that's the law and not some other thing. You know, when we see a pattern in nature, uh, and whether you have theological ideas about the sort of perfection of the heavens or not, you still, when you see a pattern in nature, a mathematical pattern, you kind of take notice and go, oh, that's very interesting. What, what, why is that? Why isn't it just the period is proportional to the radius or, or radius to the fourth power? Why, or radius squared? Why is it this particular relationship? And the third thing that he saw is a little bit more um, sort of technical, but he saw that the planets speed up when they get close to the sun and they slow down when they get far from the sun in such a way that they, they kind of fill an area. This is called the sector velocity, um, and we don't need to know that, but that in equal times, they sweep out an equal area. So when, if, if we imagine that these two areas that I drew are equal, then that would mean that the motion of the planet occurs in the same time interval those two parts of the motion. So again, that's a very precise and, and sort of obscure mathematical feature and kind of begs scientists to, to try to answer why. You know, why is it like this? So um, that's Kepler's contribution. He created this mystery and he sort of unleashed it on the, the world and um, it, it, it created, uh, you know, almost his area in the scientific community. People, everybody started working on this problem to try to understand why things are this way when everybody for thousands of years had thought that they were another way. But Kepler himself spent the rest of his life trying to come up with some kind of mathematical unifying principle that explained all of this, and he was unsuccessful. And so then we come along, and I think it's so appropriate right now to talk about this. Um, We talk about this guy, Isaac Newton. Has anybody ever heard of that guy? 
Raise your hand if you ever heard of it. One or two of you. Yeah, so everybody's heard of this guy. Um, so Isaac Newton, this is really interesting. I mean, really, just think about that. There's like this, it's not exactly irony, but it's, it's like the opposite of irony somehow. Isaac Newton was a college student, okay? And he was at college, and he was in physics class, just like you guys. And um, his physics teacher introduced to him this problem, you know, this mystery that everybody, including his physics teacher, was trying to figure out himself. And then in the middle of the semester, plague broke out, and they had to close the school. And all the students had to go home. <laughs> And, uh, but they didn't have the internet, so they couldn't do distance learning. So Isaac Newton, during this plague, goes home, and when he got home, he discovered his mom had bought a farm and wanted to be a farmer. He had no interest in farming. I bet some of you got home and found out your parents decided to take up gardening or something, you know? And uh, he had no interest in farming, so he basically hold himself up in his room, like, like you guys probably do, but he didn't have Netflix. So <laughs> he worked on this problem, and he figured it out. You know, So this guy, he's a student. He, he, he doesn't know a whole lot yet, but he gets this, his mind is sort of open, and he gets this, this mystery. He goes home, and he figures it out, and he comes up with the theory of gravity. Which is, you know, probably, if you've heard of him, it, it, this might be why, his theory of gravity, which, you know, when I first learned about it, I thought it sounded kind of weird, because here, you know, did no one really know about gravity before Newton? I mean, he really, he was like this kid, and he sat under a tree, and an apple fell on his head, and he's the first person to notice that apples fall out of trees, or that you shouldn't park your car underneath the bridge, you know, because of the pigeons. No, everybody, everybody knew about gravity. So what he did when he discovered, quote unquote, discovered gravity, is he explained, he, he came up with a mathematical formula for gravity. It says the force of gravity, and again, we'll go over this when we get to our gravity chapter, is equal to a constant called Newton's gravitational constant times the, the product of the masses times the distance squared. So what this means is that, say, the Earth and the Sun, or another planet in the Sun, there's a force of attraction between them. And this force gets bigger the bigger the masses are, but it gets smaller the farther apart they are. And, you know, using this equation and what are known as Newton's three laws of motion, he was able to explain all of Kepler's observations. They all come from Newton's laws of motion and this theory of gravity. And so this basically launched him into almost instant international fame and recognition. And he kind of, for the rest of his life, he was the number one scientist really in the world. And uh, he, he did other things, but he, in particular, he was working on this gravity thing. He, uh, he kind of figured out a, a cool math trick that nobody had done before. Um, has anybody heard of Newton's math, special math trick? I bet some of you have have learned his trick somewhere. Anyone learned his Newton's math trick? No? Okay, his, his math trick is called calculus. So he, he figured this out on his own while he was trying to solve this problem of gravity, but what's really cool this was very smart, crafty, I guess crafty of him. He didn't tell anyone about calculus. So he published all this stuff about gravity and about his laws of motion, which we're going to let in a minute. Um, but he, he figured out calculus, and he kept it his secret. Okay? And it was this incredibly powerful mathematical tool, and he could use it to solve these problems that everybody else thought were impossible to solve. He could solve it almost like on the back of a napkin, you know, using calculus. And so people really thought he was like a wizard. It, it, was, it was really like if you went back in time, but you had your smartphone somehow connected to the Internet of the future, and people would come in and ask you a question and say, hey, uh, you know, Isaac, um, you know the capital of Mongolia? And he'd say, oh, yeah, uh, hold on a second. Um, give me a sec. Yeah. 
And he turned his back and he'd look it up and he'd tell them, like, you know, he, it's like he knew everything somehow about this math trick. So maybe 20 years later, uh, a, a, um, another mathematician named Got, Gottfried Leibniz published, created on his own and published calculus. And then there was a big intellectual dispute. Who gets to have credit for calculus? And uh, Newton, because he was sort of the number one guy in the world, and the, the British Royal Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences got to rule in the dispute. They ruled that Newton got, you know, gets the credit. But, um, and Leibniz actually became a laughing stock in, in Europe. The people made fun of him. Um, Voltaire wrote a play called Candide that is specifically, its purpose is to make fun, fun of Leibniz. Um, and Newton later in life uh, was quoted as saying, this is a direct quote, let me make sure I get it right. He really enjoyed crushing Leibniz's spirit. So he was not a nice guy. He wasn't a nice guy, but he was very, very smart. Um, and he, he had these really incredible contributions to science. And it's his fault, not my fault, that you're in this class right now. Because if he didn't do all this work, then this subject wouldn't really exist most likely. So um, his three laws of motion, this is what we're really after today, okay? So so you've probably heard all of these, maybe in a middle school science class or high school science class or even just, you know, on TV or, or something. Um, the first law this is sometimes known as the law of inertia, but I'll just write it out. It says it is, uh, maybe I'll say it first and then write it. It is the tendency of objects in motion to stay in motion and objects at rest to stay at rest. So. Sorry, my computer's having a little bit of lag here, so I'm gonna let catch up. Okay, it is a tendency of objects in motion to stay in motion and objects at rest to stay at rest. Raise your hand if you've heard that before. Okay, most of you have heard that. Um, now, um, raise your hand if you believe that. Okay, that's probably about the same numbers as who have heard it. So these days, this is sort of conventional wisdom. This is, we, we just all kind of learn this and see the world this way. But at Newton's time, this was extremely controversial. There probably were not three people in the world that believed this when Newton said it. Um, because before Newton came along, the conventional wisdom was that it is the tendency of objects in motion to come to rest. And it's all the tendency of objects at rest to stay at rest. In, in essence, everybody before Newton, starting from Aristotle, Aristotle had made this claim and said it is the natural tendency of things in motion to come to rest. And everybody agreed with that until Newton came along. And it, it makes sense because that's what we observe. Everything in the world that we observe in motion eventually is going to stop moving. Even, you know, even humans, you, you're born and you... You know, you move around and maybe 70 years, 90 if you're lucky, you move around and one day you lay down and that's it. Eternal rest from then on. The only things in the universe that don't seem to come to rest are the heavenly bodies, the planets, the sun, the moon, the stars. So it was thought that the natural order of things is everything comes to rest and only these heavenly bodies get to keep moving, and so we just have to explain why do the heavenly bodies, what keeps them going? And the answer is 
God or gods or angels or some supernatural, you know, agency. If you're the Greeks, it's the god Helios who has a chariot and he drags the sun around and every day you're just hoping he doesn't die. Something doesn't happen and he forgets to come up and the sun doesn't come up. Um, if you're a medieval European, it's, you know, probably their angelic force is responsible for keeping these in motion. Um, but it had to be explained because it was not the natural order of things. And Newton comes along and says, no, no, that's the natural order of things. Objects in motion just tend to stay in motion forever. So what the stars and the sun and moon and planets and, and Earth are all doing is just the natural thing. It's on Earth where things tend to come to rest that we have to explain it. And we, we can't just say that's the way it is. We have to explain it. And the explanation, he says, is friction. So, for example, if you kick a soccer ball, I know, again, with the soccer balls, right? If you kick a soccer ball on tall grass, it, it moves a certain distance, and, but not very far, and it stops. If you kick it on shorter grass, it goes a longer distance. If the grass is really short or you have maybe nice artificial turf, it will keep going for quite a while. If you would kick it onto, say, a frozen lake, it would probably keep skidding all the way across the lake. Okay, and, and Newton said, if you keep reducing the friction, eventually things will just keep going forever. So he said that it must be the case that where the heavenly objects live is a frictionless environment. There is somehow no friction there. And that must mean it's you know, empty. There's nothing there for, for the planets to be rubbing on as they move the way a, a ball rubs on, on the grass. So that's the first law. And like I said, nobody really believed it at his time, but he had a really good convincing argument. He said, he started with the second half. He said, okay, look, everybody, you guys all believe the second half, right? An object at rest tends to stay at rest. And they said, yes, of course. So, like, let's just point to an object, a book on the table. That's at rest. It's going to stay at rest, correct? And they would say, yes, of course, Newton. It will stay at rest. He'd say, forever? Forever it's going to stay at rest? We'll never not be at rest? And they said, no, we'll never not be at rest unless somebody comes along and bumps it. It's going to stay there forever. And he said, but guess what? It's not at rest because the Earth is moving through space. The Earth is moving around the sun just like all of the other planets. And so if you believe that the book has to stay at rest forever, from someone else's point of view, they would say it has to stay in motion forever because being at rest and being in motion are the same thing. It just depends on your perspective. We're in motion. The Earth has been in motion forever as far as we know, and nobody even noticed it. You cannot tell the difference between being in motion and being at rest. It's just a matter of what frame of reference you are in. So before Tycho Brahe and Kepler, when everybody thought the Earth was sitting stationary and the planets are just moving around, this argument would not work. Okay? But once people, and by the time Newton came along, there had been decades of, of sort of Everyone adapting, adjusting their thinking to the idea that the Earth is in motion around the sun, just like the other planets. Once you recognize that the Earth is also in motion, you, you see that, that the first law has to be correct. So he was able to win people over. And the first law actually isn't even necessary, but he had to get people on the same page as him first before he introduced the second law. So the second law is written mathematically, but it says things in motion do change their motion. So first law, if we were to write it as a mathematical statement, we would just say A equals zero. That means the velocity stays the same forever, and it's a vector. But they can't even change their direction according to the first law. Everything in motion stays in motion and the fine print is it stays in motion in a straight line at constant speed okay the second law says the acceleration is not always zero and mathematically we would write it this way the so this symbol here that's the Greek letter Sigma 
and it stands for the sum of, S-U-M, like mathematical sum, add up. The sum of the forces equals the mass times acceleration. So really what Newton says is nothing accelerates unless there are forces acting on it. And if there are forces acting on it, the size of the acceleration will depend on the size of the forces. The bigger the forces, the bigger the acceleration. Now this mass, this is actually a new concept when Newton introduces it. It is not the same as weight. What is mass exactly? Mass, if we rearrange this, it would be the ratio of the net force over the acceleration. In other words, if I push an object and I see a small acceleration, it barely moves, then it must have a big mass. On the other hand, if I push an object and I see a very big acceleration, it must have a small mass. So what mass is, and keep in mind, we all know what mass is. I mean, maybe we confuse it with weight a little bit because they're very close. But this concept didn't really exist in Newton's day because what mass is is how much an object likes to obey the first law. An object with a lot of mass really likes to obey the first law. It is very hard to make an object in motion that has a lot of mass stop being in motion or even to change its speed. Just imagine a moving train. There's a runaway train, it is very hard. You have to basically be Spider-Man or Superman, the Incredible Hulk, somebody to stop a moving train, okay? It's very, very hard because it has a lot of mass. But moving ping pong balls are very easy to stop. Okay? Anybody can stop a moving ping pong ball. So Newton, in this one equation, he kind of invents the concept of mass. Mass is the tendency of objects to resist changes in motion, and the, the, the mass itself would be a, a measurement of, of that thing, of that quantity. He also creates the concept of force with this equation, because before Newton, it did not need to be explained why things slow down. That was just thought to be their nature. You just kick a ball, and it just, on its own, it slows down. And so it was thought it would slow down in the absence of any other object. It would still slow down because that was its nature. But Newton said, no, it, you need forces. If something accelerates, he says things don't accelerate unless they, there's a cause. So the name he gives to that cause is force. Now, we don't know if forces exist. We can't see the force. We see the acceleration. And because we now believe things don't accelerate on their own, just imagine your uh, computer starts moving all of a sudden on its own. That would be very strange, and you'd be looking around the room to figure out what's happening. Maybe you throw your computer away because it's haunted. I don't know your particular you know, feeling about ghosts, but maybe you're looking for strings or trying to figure out how your you know, friend or partner, sibling, whoever is messing with you. But we don't see things just accelerate on their own. If we see something accelerate, we assume something caused it. And that thing we assume is a force. But we cannot see the force or hear the force or smell it or taste it. Uh, we feel when we touch something, we feel something. We feel an interaction. That interaction is not exactly the force. So this second law is really what we're after in this next chapter because this is how we find the acceleration. Okay, so our skill of adding up vectors, that's what some of the forces means. It means add up vectors. That's gonna be an essential skill going forward because we will have different force vectors. We need, as we know, we need to be able to find their components. We have to be able to add up their components to get a resultant component, which we would call that the net force. And then we even want to know the direction of that thing so we can know the direction of the acceleration vector. So that's the key focus. But we're not done because there is also Newton's third law. Now the third law is the one that almost everybody gets wrong. Even, I mean, my high school physics teacher got it wrong. I know that much. And it took me quite a while to really understand it. Um, but 
uh, in English, I'll say it in English. In English, sometimes people say for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Raise your hand if you've heard that before. Okay, good. A lot of people have heard that. Just forget that because that sounds like nonsense. It's so hard to understand what the heck that means. When you hear that, I don't know why. This is probably because I'm like a physicist and maybe a little bit nerdy, but I think of superheroes. Somehow, if for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, I think if there's a supervillain, there will be a superhero who will fight him. I know that has nothing to do with it, but it's very vague. What is an action exactly? What is a reaction? That's not so clear, and that's not the only unclear thing. So I don't like to write it in English. I like to say it as a math sentence. And so the way I write this is force of object one acting on object two. Okay, so if we've got two objects, object one and object two, and object one exerts a force on object two, this symbol would represent the force of one acting on two. Okay, that's supposed to be an arrow there is equal to the force of two acting back on one. There's a minus sign in front because if object one pushes object two to the right, then object two is going to push object one to the left. So this is important because it makes it clear that these two forces are acting on different objects. One of the forces is acting on object two, and the other is acting on object one. So these two forces never cancel out. Whereas when you say for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, or if you said every force there's an equal and opposite force, it kind of sounds like motion is impossible. If I push a book, there's going to be an equal and opposite force pushing the book. And so why does the book move? That's not what Newton's third law is saying at all. It says if I push the book, the book also pushes me. And if I push it with 10 pounds of force, it's pushing me with 10 pounds of force. So I cannot push something harder than it pushes back on me. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Sometimes I worry that, you know, I, I'll tell you this and you'll think, oh, this is perfect because... Maybe there's someone in your life, you know, some kind of bully who's bothering you, you know, um, but he's he's six foot seven and weighs 300 pounds, so you've been letting it slide because just being practical. And you just discovered, I told you, he cannot push you harder than you can push him. So you go and you find this guy, and I don't know what your issue is. Maybe I'll just imagine he's he's bothering your sister, okay? And, and you say, hey, man. You know, stop messing with my sister. I've, I've had enough of your stuff. And you come, you know, you come to the lecture tomorrow and I see your, you don't turn your video on because you've got a, your arm is in a sling and you have a black eye and, you know, you're all messed up. But you later tell me, you know, Jonathan, you, you lied to me because uh, I went and I, I pushed that guy and, Nothing happened, and then he, he put his hand on my face, and he, he just pushed me, and I went down the stairs, and he pushed me a lot harder than I pushed him. And I would have to reply to you, no, no, you misunderstood. When he was pushing your face, your face was pushing him back just as hard. But he didn't move, you did move. Can anyone, can anyone resolve that? Why, if, if someone's pushing you, someone a lot bigger than you, and they push you, and you're pushing them just as hard, but you're the one that, that you know, moves backward and they don't go anywhere. Anyone have an idea why that might be? Dustin? Uh, the force exhibited on his face was greater than the force pushing back. No, see, that's what I'm telling you is that according to the third law, if, you know, let me... Um, Okay, so if, if somebody's pushing, pushing my face with 50 pounds of force, my face is pushing their hand with 50 pounds of force, the same exact force. That's what Newton's third law says. It says it's impossible for his hand to put more force on my face than my face puts on his hand. And yet somehow, 
when that 300 pound guy pushes my face, hopefully that never happens, but I fall, I go flying backward and he doesn't go anywhere. Any other ideas why he doesn't go anywhere and I do? Or maybe she, I don't know. Could be girl bully. Elena, the mask. Yeah, that's a big part of it, right? So the forces are equal, but the effect of a force on all mass is different from the effect of the same force on a large mass. So first thing is, they have more mass, so the effect should not be the same. But secondly, it has to do with friction. Because they're more massive, they're more heavy, and they have more friction. And if somebody pushes you and you're on like a rolling chair, you're just going to start rolling, you know, no matter how big you are. You'll just start rolling back because you don't have enough friction to stop you from moving. So anyway, it should be clear to you if, uh, if you have this situation, you, you need to find this guy when he's on rollerblades. Okay, if you can find him on rollerblades, you can take him. I don't care how big he is. It doesn't matter. It's the friction. So going back to uh, my, my sheet here, my um, whiteboard. It's really the second law that's going to tell us if that person is going to accelerate. And we have to examine all of the forces acting on that person. So not just my face on his hand, but also the force of gravity and the force of friction and any other forces. Um, we could also think about Newton's third law from the perspective of tug of war. So in tug of war, you know, one group is pulling on one side of the rope and the other group's pulling on the other side of the rope. And if we have a tug of war match between the football team and the soccer team, American football team and the soccer team, who do you think generally wins that tug of war, tug of war match? It's okay. I know I'm not going to be offended when you say American football just because I'm a soccer person. Everybody knows American football team beats the high school football team beats the high school soccer team in tug of war. Okay. But the reason they beat them is not because they pull harder. It's because they weigh more and they have more friction. But if you gave the soccer team, if you let them wear their cleats, and you water the grass where the football players are standing and make them be barefoot, the soccer team will win the tug of war. Because the pull in the rope, there's one force in the rope. There's one number, some number of pounds of force, or we're going to learn metric units soon. But that number is in the rope, and it's the same number pulling on both sides of the rope. So um, let me tell you a different way to think about the third law. And again, the third law is largely important from a conceptual standpoint, but from a calculational standpoint, we're going to mostly, mostly be using the second law. What the third law really says is that when, there, when something exerts a force, what you really have is an interaction. There is an interaction between two objects. It could be this guy's hand in my face, or it could be, you know, just uh, someone you're pushing your book away from you. So there is an interaction between you and the book. There is only one interaction between you and the book. And that interaction is its own kind of thing. But my perception of the interaction is what I would call the force of one on two. And the book's perception, if it had a perception, uh, the book's experience of the force would be called F of two acting on one. There's one interaction, but the effect of that interaction on one side or the other, one object or the other, is what we call the force. But they're really coming from one single interaction. So it's not possible that I'm interacting with the book with a 10-pound 10 10 force, but somehow I only feel 8 pounds of force and the book feels 10 pounds of force. There's only one interaction. So we'll get a lot of practice with the second law and also see how the third law fits in. 
next week. Are there any questions for now about Newton's law? Okay, I want to just point out one thing, and this is really uh, geared toward people who have had physics before. Okay, so if you haven't physics before, still pay attention, but this is mostly targeted at people who had physics before. So just imagine we have uh, a box sitting on the ground, and I want to uh, draw in the forces acting on the box because I want to know its acceleration, and I want to be able to add up its forces. So one force is going to be, let me use blue. No, that's not blue. So this would be the force of gravity acting on the box. And there could also be, there, there's also a force of contact between the ground and the box that's pointing upward. I'm going to call that F sub C for force of contact just for the moment. Okay, and I'm just doing this as an illustration. Now, if the box doesn't go anywhere, if we say sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration, but I see that the box doesn't go anywhere, and that would mean that the force of contact plus the force of gravity, they must add up to zero, and therefore the force of contact is minus the force of gravity. Now this looks an awful lot like Newton's third law, but it is not. It really came from Newton's second law. Okay? Now, according to this, the contact force and the force of gravity are equal size forces and opposite in direction, which is exactly what third law says should be happening. But they have nothing to do with the third law. It is a coincidence. Now, when I first learned physics, I thought this is what the third law was talking about, because this happens a lot in our problems. But this is not what the third law is talking about. So what is the third law talking about? The third law says that if the ground pushes up on the box, then the box must also push down on the ground. Okay, so the, the, this red force of the ground pushing up on the box is paired to this red force of the box pushing down on the ground. And if we look at the force of gravity, that is the earth pulling down on the box and so somewhere down at the bottom, you know, center of the Earth, there is the action-reaction pair of this force of gravity. Okay? Those guys are equal and opposite forces. The red ones are equal and opposite forces. That's what Newton's third law is talking about. But we don't generally care about these forces. I only care about the forces acting on the box. Those guys may or may not cancel based on what the acceleration looks like. These guys, I don't, in 95% of problems, I do not care that the box is pushing down on the ground or that the gravity is pulling up on the earth. I don't care about that. So most of the time we draw those ones in circles in. What I care about is that, um, you know, all the forces on the box. So suppose I added another force like this on the box. What's going to happen when I do that? Let's call that F applied. I'm pushing. It's now It is not true that the contact force is just equal and opposite to the gravitational force. In fact, I would have to find a way to add these three vectors to get zero, which means this guy probably gets a little shorter. Maybe even it winds up doing something like that, so that when I add these three vectors, I still get zero. Then nothing looks equal and opposite to one another. So, okay, again, that was mostly geared toward people who may have had physics before, 
and they have understood that when we have this kind of thing going on, that that somehow is related to the third law when it is not. Now, we're going to cover it in great detail and very slow pace to make sure everybody gets it with lots of examples next week. But I don't want to give you, I don't want to get into the meat of that this week because I know your mind is still kind of focused on your projectile motion and getting ready for this contest. So does anyone have any questions about uh, Newton's laws right now? Okay, so um, this lecture will just be one segment, one video, one segment. But anybody who has been having questions on homework and would like to stick around and address your homework questions, uh, that's great. I will stick around and we can do that um, now. Or if you can't do that now but would like to set up to meet with me later, uh, let me know. Okay? Um, so I'll end the recording now and see some of you later and maybe some of you now.